Donc, bonjour tout le monde. <coughs> Donc, je m'appelle Jean-François Gauvin, je suis professeur au département des sciences historiques de l'Université Laval et aussi directeur du Centre de recherche et culture et société, le CELAT. Euh, comme je viens de dire en anglais rapidement à notre conférencier, donc c'est euh, une, une conférence qui, était, qui, en fait, qui a été planifiée depuis euh, plus d'un an, euh, qui devait avoir lieu euh, en présentiel, euh, donc autant à Québec qu'à Montréal, mais les circonstances font en sorte qu'évidemment, on se retrouve en, en virtuel, donc en Zoom. Et la conférence aussi est dans le cadre d'un cours du programme de DESS en muséologie que je dirige. Donc, c'est un immense plaisir pour moi de recevoir Yanni Loukissas, euh, aujourd'hui professeur euh, agrégé de médias numériques à l'Université de Georgia Tech. Les travaux de Yanni euh, ont été une sorte de révélation pour moi. En effet, le domaine de la visualisation de données numériques pour la culture et les musées est en plein essor et je voulais trouver une manière d'y participer. Avec l'aide de Vincent Larivière, qui est titulaire de la chaire de recherche du Canada sur les transformations de la communication savante à l'Université de Montréal, et Maxime Sainte-Marie, qui était alors un post-doctorant à la chaire. Nous avons fait une petite étude numérique basée sur les données de la collection d'instruments scientifiques de l'Université Harvard, euh, où je travaillais jusqu'en 2018. Depuis, je continue de faire mes armes dans ce domaine à partir des, domaines, euh, des données numérisées euh, de spécimens de l'herbier Louis-Marie, ici à l'Université Laval. Yanni est un spécialiste en la matière. Ses publications et ses réalisations nous permettent de voir autrement les données d'une manière à la fois créative et critique. Une telle analyse permet de concevoir l'implication sociale des technologies numériques émergentes. Ces projets actuels concernent l'étude critique des données, les médias environnementaux, l'éthique et la responsabilité civile du numérique et les pratiques participatives de la visualisation de données. Contrairement à ce que l'on croit du numérique, les données ne sont pas universelles, mais bien locales. Qu'est-ce que cela veut dire exactement? Eh bien, aujourd'hui, Yannick Loukissa s'entretiendra avec nous sur ce thème qui fait l'objet de son tout récent livre publié aux presses de l'Université du MIT en 2019 et intitulé, comme, le nom de, comme la conférence d'aujourd'hui, « All data are local, thinking critically in a data-driven society ». Sa conférence se déroulera en anglais. So, thank you, Yannick, for agreeing to talk to us today. And now the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I am delighted to be here after a long time uh, trying to make this work out, this, this timing. And, um, you know, I can't say we're, we're all together, but at least, uh, <laughs> you know, we, you know, we're here and, and um, um, we're still figuring out how this works. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, what you all think of, of the work and questions and, and comments you might have. Uh, so I'm going to give a bit of a introduction to my book, um, as was mentioned, and, uh, and then talk a little bit about how it has influenced um, current work that I'm doing that you may be less familiar with if you're, if you're familiar with the book. Um, let me just share my share my screen here because I have some slides. Okay. Okay. Can can people see this? Full screen looks good? Okay, great. Okay. So as I said, Um, I, I wrote a book, a, it's a couple of years ago now. It, it, it you know, still feels recent, but it was in 2019 that All Data Are Local came out uh, from MIT Press. Um, this is a book uh, in which I really tried to bridge what I saw as a, a gap between two areas of work, which I find very exciting, but unfortunately aren't or haven't been in, in such close dialogue. On one hand, data visualization, which, as you probably know, is the graphical presentation of evidence. Uh, and it's a design practice. Um, and on the other hand, uh, the more recent and still emerging field of data studies or, or critical data studies, we might say, which is really coming out of the humanities and social sciences, trying to reveal some of the assumptions and values that often visualizations overlook. 
I, I think there's a lot that these two areas of, of study can um, and practice can lend one another. And the book is kind of about that intersection. In the book, I really try to focus on public data. Uh, you know, often we talk a lot about privacy in relationship to data, but I'm concerned that, you know, the public data, we don't understand well enough. We don't understand how to use it. Um, we don't understand the implications. Um, we don't even understand what it means for something to be public. Uh, so I'm very interested in how people might engage with public data in new ways that are both more effective and more just. So I wrote, I started writing this book, I think back in around 2012, I guess it's almost a decade now, um, really feels like a totally different era. You know, at the time I started this work, uh, big data, you know, we're on the verge of transforming everything, right? Science, business, government, design, a lot has changed, right? Um, and in the intervening time, uh, data and algorithms have entered a new spotlight in, in, in society. And here are just a couple of uh, articles from around the time that book came out. Um, you know, and I feel like even just during the time I was writing the book, you know, the context had changed radically. The idea of uh, big data's unfettered potential really seems quaint today. And, and, and we're well aware of the dangerous sides of data, the, the biases, the absences, the unanticipated impacts, the blatant misuse, right? Data can be racist, data can be sexist, they can be simply fake. Um, and the, the examples run the gamut from p-hacking, which is, you know, uh, exaggerating the statistical significance of your, of your work if you're a scientist, um, to election hacking, right? Uh, and uh, all having said all that, <laughs> I don't think we're ready to give up on data as a way of knowing about the world, right? And, and maybe the last year with a pandemic has uh, impressed that upon us even more, that we've been so reliant on data to know what's going on, even as we're trapped in our homes. Um, and uh, the, the, the pandemic has shown us all kinds of their, you know, tremendous new lessons, um, including new ways that data can be, can be flawed, um, even while they're vital, that, that, that there are ways in which um, the data we have um, overlook the experiences of, of, of certain people. Of course, you know, these are you know, the traditionally and historically marginalized um, groups in our societies. Um, so how do we find a way forward? And that's really, I think, the, the message of this book. And I, I think that I only feel more strongly about after, after going through this year that, that we can work with data uh, more effectively and ethically, um, uh, particularly when we acknowledge that data are coming from places and times um, that are unfamiliar to us. Um, you know, public data often, uh, um, you know, created somewhere else, right? Um, they're not created by us. So I think the way forward really comes from actually a long history of work that's been pointing this direction um, from, uh, from STS, um, which stands for um, Science and Technology Studies, from feminist and post-colonial <clears throat> critiques of objectivity, from people like Sandra Harding, Donna Haraway, um, more recently Anita Chen, um, or um, maybe you've gotten the new um, data feminism book uh, from Lauren Klein and Catherine D'Ignazio that's become very popular. You know, all of these voices are helping us to acknowledge that data are situated, right? Uh, now, for myself and my own work, I'm, I'm interested um, not just how data are situated in the sense of embodiment, um, who knows or who makes data, but also where. Uh, and I'm very interested in the, in the role of place in relationship to data. Um, how are data produced and used differently in different places? And why does that matter? And how does knowing that help us understand data? Of course, uh, the, the, the argument, my argument is really summed up by the title. 
um, all data are local. And what I mean by that is data are created by people and they're dutiful machines, I like to say, um, in a time, in a place, uh, with the tools at hand, working within existing organizational structures. Uh, and I think we often overlook this part for audiences that are conditioned, even disciplined to receive them. You know, the, the notion of open data is usually that, uh, you know, data should be legally and technically available to all, but um, that doesn't change the fact that data were created with certain audiences in mind. Um, when I use the term local here, I mean something relative. So local is not an absolute scale, right? It doesn't mean your neighborhood. Uh, it, can, it can be um, local to a network. It can be local to a city, to a state, to a, to a county, to a country. Local is defined by difference that there's something outside of the local. And for data, that's usually us, <laughs> you know, for public data, usually we're outside of the situation, the context in which the data are made. So we need to learn something about that context in order to work with the data effectively. And that's really my point. Let me give a, a, a simple example, uh, you know, and a concrete one. Um, <clears throat> this is the New York Public Library. Um, maybe maybe some of you have been here. Um, it's one of the most famous tourist sites in New York City, uh, right on Fifth Avenue. And you know maybe this is a shocking photo actually today for people to see all of these crowds gathered together, <laughs> maskless. Um, you know, but it's also an, an incredibly um, well resourced uh, public um, uh, cultural repository and. Um, and New York Public Library has done a lot to digitize its collections, put those collections online, make them accessible, make them open. Um, last time I checked, they had um, about 800,000 digitized objects, and that's not just books, but maps and images and um, even some stuffed animals. I think they have, uh, uh, is it Winnie the Pooh and, 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 their, uh, and his compatriots? Um, and um, I was doing a project with a student about the New York Public Library, actually as part of a larger look at the Digital Public Library of America, which maybe we can talk about later on if people are interested in, um, which is the effort to bring data from libraries and archives and museums and other kinds of uh, institutions of cultural collecting across the United States together in, in one, in one uh, to make them accessible from one portal, so to speak. Um, but we were looking particularly at uh, the New York Public Library, and we were trying to put some of these objects on a timeline. And in the process, it occurred to us to ask, um, well, we, we noticed that there were different ways of writing the date um, at the New York Public Library, just one institution, you know, a highly professionalized institution. And you'd think, that institution like this would have its ducks in a row, so to speak, and would have a pretty consistent schema um, for recording such things. And often if I'm at a, you know, if I'm at a talk and there's a there's an audience, um, I ask people, how many, how many different ways of writing the date do you think we found? And I don't know, I, maybe people have seen, you now if you've read the book, you know the answer to this question. So, so I want to ask you, but um, Sometimes people will say five, 10, occasionally I'll hear 50. Well, we found uh, around 1,719 um, formats. Now, I say around because depending on the, we use a specific algorithm to try to figure this out. And depending on your algorithm, you might get a different result because similarity is, um, who is it, um, Mary Douglas that says similarity is an institution? Um, you know, so we have to decide what, what counts as the same. Um, and so I'll zoom in a bit more so you can see in, in more detail. And as you see these you begin to, you know, it makes a little more sense. These are very human in a way. And you can imagine they're written for specific um, time and conditions with a limited knowledge. So, you know, sometimes there's partial 
um, uh, record. So the underscores here are basically integers, uh, you know. So and the red number is the number of times that that date format was used. So one time or thirty nine thousand five hundred ninety nine times. Um, sometimes you have Roman numerals. Um, sometimes you have the name of the printer. Uh, sometimes you only know the year, or maybe you know kind of approximately the decade. So um, you immediately see that they, this is a kind of rich, vibrant, you know, uh, a, a collection of information. And what data visualization designers usually do in a circumstance like this is they try to clean the data, which means finding some common denominator, some you know, uh, some way to reduce all of these examples to um, one format. So we can put, let's say, line these all up on a timeline conveniently. Um, and anything that doesn't fit, we'll have to throw it out, right? And uh, you can see how you would lose a lot of information here. And uh, I think, you know, looking at this and, and thinking about the language around it, cleaning data, uh, you know, it recalls for me the work of uh, Mary Douglas again and uh, her book, Purity and Danger. I don't know if people are familiar with Douglas, who is an anthropologist who wrote a lot about dirt. <laughs> and if we think of these kind of non conforming formats as data dirt, what does that, what does that mean? And for Douglas, Dirt was not a um, an objective category. It's more of a rhetorical one. Uh, you know, dirt was just um, matter out of place. Douglas called it right. So imagine you're outside, and um, or imagine maybe this is a simpler example. Imagine you're eating lunch, and you have a sandwich that has some sauce on it. Um, that sauce is not dirt. But if it drips on your shirt right before a big presentation, <laughs> your shirt's dirty, right? So it's not the, the sauce itself that's dirty, but it's where it is. It's out of place. So we might, when we look at you know, these kinds of uh, artifacts, I like to call them, uh, you know, we could think about them as data out of place. We don't understand the context in which they were useful, in which they were meaningful. And um, we're trying to use them um, differently in a new place at a new time, um, and they're inconvenient for us. So, you know, I think this brings me to you know one of the main points of the book, which is that we need to be, move beyond thinking, talking, and working with talking about and working with data sets. Uh, a data set suggests something that's complete. It's closed, it's portable, you can take it with you. Um, you can transfer it anywhere. Uh, and we need to think more about data settings. Data are really entangled with uh, places and times and, and organizations and people. And they're part of, of what Sandra Harding called a knowledge system. And we're, if we're to understand data, we really need to understand the no that knowledge system that data are a part of. Um, so there's a couple different topics I want to take you through. Let's see, it's 12.54 now. I have until what time? Uh, I don't know, about uh, another 35 minutes, something okay. like that. Okay, sounds good. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this question of what are data. I've been saying this term a lot. I haven't really defined it. And I think that definition is, is important. I want to say a, a few words about uh, digital universalism, a, a term that Anita Chan uh, uh, ha, has introduced. And, and then finally, I want to end with what I call principles of locality, uh, how we have, you know, the principles that can help us think about data in a local context. And then uh, yet if we have time, an example from ongoing work um, called the Map Room Project. Okay. So, one of my favorite definitions of data comes from Christine Borgman and Mike, Michael Buckland um, in, in Borgman's book, Big Data, Little Data, No Data. She writes that uh, data, much like dirt, is a rhetorical category. 
uh, and doesn't really have a lot of essential properties. Um, and I'm very interested in this question of what people uh, claim is data. And, 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 and Christine uh, Borgman sums this up by, by saying, well, data are more or less alleged evidence. And actually asking what are data or what is data is the wrong question. We should ask when are data, because anything can become data when you take it up as evidence to support a claim. So she gives the example of, you know, you find a box of old photographs in your parents' attic. That's not inherently data, but if you start making claims about those photographs, you know, what they say about your, your family, you know, the, the sartorial trends of the day, the mechanics of the cameras used to make them, then they become data, right? And this is a wonderful definition, but I think it leaves something out. And it's a sense, our sense that data should work are meant to travel, right? We, we can take data from one place to another and they still function in this evidentiary capacity. Uh, and that's captured well by um, STS scholar, Bruno Latour, who calls data immutable mobiles. And, and you know that means exactly what it says, that they are things that can be moved and they don't change when they move. Um, and so we have this expectation that, that um, data will work anywhere. Um, now, of course, scholarship since um, Latour wrote this, um, I guess back in the 80s, I think, has really shown you know, just how much work is necessary to get data to, um, to act as evidence in new, in new places and times. Um, and so I think we can, you know, we can say that um, data are more like allegedly mobile evidence. <laughs> so these are forms of evidence that we say will travel, um, uh, uh, but then it, it kind of remains to be seen um, what happens when we move them and how they're interpreted and made use of in new ways. Um, so my approach for doing this work, it, it, you know, I talk about it as local reading and, 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 you know, it's, I guess it's a form of close reading of data, trying to, instead of visualizing huge data sets, actually looking at the data in its rawest form. Um, here's an example of data from the Arnold Arboretum in Boston in a card catalog. You know, data exists in these, in these material ways. Um, we go to where the data are, and data are always somewhere, you know, just because they're digital doesn't mean they're like in the cloud, <laughs> you know, and um, where are people making data, where are people using data, and we, and we take a, um, you know, what Sher Sherry Ortner would call an ethnographic stance, um, and that means we use ourselves as an instrument of investigation. And we ask about what looks strange to us in the data. Um, we talk to people who are involved in making the data or who are maybe um, subjects of the data. Um, so we step into this knowledge system, um, th this context, and we try to understand something more than just um, what's in the record. Now, we don't need to become ethnographers um, to approach data in this way, but uh, we do need to adopt some of these sensibilities. So I, I want to say a couple words about the stakes of this work, um, because I do think there are pretty important stakes. Um, and I think it has to do with how we think about the importance of, of place, particularly in relationship to our new digital um, um, technologies and um, aspirations, I should say. And there has been a long history, actually, in, in, in digital media of uh, what I'd call an agno uh, a place agnosticism, you know, uh, a, a sense that place is matter matters less and less. And we can trace this back to people like Marshall McLuhan, you know, who wrote about um, electronic media collapsing space and time to Nicholas Negroponte, you know, who started the media lab at MIT, who wrote, being digital means less and less dependence upon being in a specific place at a specific time um, um, back in the 90s. And 
uh, Anita Chan, as I said, summed this up as digital universalism, the sense that when we're using digital systems, it, it doesn't matter who we are, when we are, or where we are. And uh, I think that there's an opportunity in uh, thinking locally about data to, to challenge this, this assumption, this, this myth. Uh, and I want to read a little bit from, from the book um, to give you a sense of how I characterize this. I write, the diversity and prosperity of the world's varied and contingent digital practices depend on our acceptance of data's locality. If left unchallenged, digital universalism could become a new kind of colonialism in which practitioners at the periphery are made to conform to the expectations of a dominant technological culture. Learning to look at the local conditions of data can be a form of resistance to the ideology of digital universalism and threat of erasure that it poses to myriad data cultures. The ways in which you know, this universalist stance kind of expects us to conform to certain ways of um, making data, um, treating data, thinking about the relationship between data and, and people and data and places. Um, so having said that though, we don't want to romanticize the local, right? Because um, the local can bring with it all kinds of undesirable assumptions and, and practices. And just to give an example of that, maybe let's turn to another facade um, of the, the Smithsonian um, Museum uh, of American Art in Washington, DC. And this is an example that came to me from a former curator uh, who worked there um, for a time, Maria McWhorter, um, who's an African-American woman, um, a historian and now a, um, a professor at the University of Arizona. And McWhorter recalled how um, working at the Smithsonian, one day she decided to do a search of the digital collections. And she searched for the word black. And it returned something like this. I, I worked with her to, to kind of try to recreate this search in their, in their website but it's uh, a bunch of artifacts that are linked to, categorized as being part of black culture in some way. Um, and then she searched for the term white. And what do you think she found? Well, nothing about white culture. Um, you know, here are kind of plants that are the color white, um, somebody whose name is white, actually a number of people, um, you know, other, the White House. So in this search, um, McWhorter found that, um, saw actually what was, what was absent here. Um, so that, um, you know, what this reveals is that as an institution, Smithsonian tracks black culture as a category, but doesn't track whiteness. And that signified to her that whiteness is the default. It's the default category, the default cultural category against which other categories have to be differentiated. And that is a kind of absence in the archive that we have to take note of and that we can only see through this comparison, right? So this is something beyond what we'd call bias, right? It's, it's really how data are shaped by invisible values and assumptions that there's actually an implicit ideology of white supremacy going on here that we otherwise uh, wouldn't see um, if we weren't to have this comparative um, analysis. And I think it's something that, you know, when I first started working on this book and toying with this, um, term local, I was reading a lot of uh, Clifford Geertz, um, the anthropologist, and um, he has a whole book on local knowledge. And he says, you can actually only understand one locality by comparing it to another one. You can't understand it in relationship to some imagined universal. And actually, this is something I do with my students all the time that I ask them, you know, we start working with a data source and I say, why don't you find how similar data are collected elsewhere? And once they do that, then 
the particularities of the original source just kind of a, appear to them. They start to realize, oh, there are certain choices being made here. And I think it's, so it's a very important thing to do to kind of approach data in a, in a comparative way. So, you know, the, the, these examples are just to kind of set up, you know, hopefully a conversation about, about the book. Um, uh, hopefully we'll have time for questions and, and so forth. Um, the book covers a lot more ground. Um, these are the, the chapters of the book. And uh, they embody these six principles um, that I described as principles of locality at the beginning of the talk. Uh, we talked about all, how all data are local. Um, the second one is data have complex attachments to place. And there's a whole chapter that explores one particular place, a place uh, called the Arnold Arboretum, which collects, has been collecting trees, vines, and shrubs in Boston um, for, uh, I guess, almost 150 years now. And how do, how is that place, um, how are data about that place? Um, how are they in that place? Um, what does it mean for data to be from that place? How are they generative of the place? Data have all kinds of interesting relationships with this one place and, and not necessarily in simple ways. Uh, um, beyond that, uh, I explore, you know, this, this, more collab this more comparative view of data that I introduced in the last example. Um, what happens when we bring data together from different sources, like we see in the Digital Public Library of America? How does that afford this comparative view? Um, and what kinds of traces of uh, their origins do data still carry in the form of classifications? of schemata, of constraints, of errors, um, of absences, and, and even rituals that go into making data. Uh, the, the next two are really about the broader implications. You know, if we understand data as local, how does that matter for thinking about algorithms um, and for thinking about the interfaces through which we encounter data? Uh, and then finally, the last principle uh, is, is is, is kind of summative, uh, the notion that data are indexes to local knowledge. And I, I often talk about, I often give this analogy to say, well, you know, if you have a book like this one and you flip to the end, um, if I can find it, you know, you have an index um, and that index is kind of like a data set. Um, it's, incredibly useful. Um, and on its own, it tells you a lot about what's in the book and, um, uh, uh, and, and could be useful on its own, but it's much more powerful in combination with the book itself. So how do we think about data as kind of part of um, and connected to broader and deeper sources of knowledge that we might wanna learn about? Uh, there are also practices that I lay out in the book that kind of stem from these principles and help us think about kind of put, putting these principles into action, you know, and, I, and I've, and I've uh, hinted at some of these. Look at the data setting, not just the data set. Think about place as part of data presentation. Um, take a comparative approach to data analysis. Uh, question or challenge algorithms by, by introducing data that maybe aren't expected. You know, this notion of counter data that, um, you know, that algorithms expect certain kinds of data inputs and we can challenge that um, uh, by, by um, um, submitting or offering up um, alternative forms of data. And we're seeing that actually happen a lot in interesting ways with facial recognition algorithms these days. Um, create interfaces that cause friction, that maybe slow us down and help us to look at and ask questions about the data rather than just taking them as facts, um, um, helping us to see data as rather as cultural artifacts. And then finally, use data to build relationships, right? The data, having more data um, 
isn't an endpoint in, in and of itself. Um, and how do we use the data to connect to other people um, and places and times? Uh, if we have time, I'd like to talk quickly about a little project uh, called the Map Room, which is a collaboration with data artist Jared Thorpe. And uh, this is a project that I think it tries to embody some of the ideas in, in the book. This is, a, it's meant to be, uh, it's a project that's about creating collaborative spaces for um, drawing maps about the places you live, right? And it works through a combination of um, using existing data sources and combining that with your own local knowledge. And so here you can see a bit of um, how it functions. These are some of my students um, in, in a version of the map room that we created at, at Georgia Tech, um, drawing part of Atlanta. And the way it works is there's an overhead projector and it illuminates a, uh, you can control it through an iPad where you um, identify the part of the city that you want to map. And then it projects the street grid onto a paper. And then you can trace that street grid um, and then and add all kinds of stories onto there, maybe kind of where you live or your route to school or work, um, places you like to go or don't like to go. And then you can turn on any data layers you want that you've kind of brought into the system and, and see your lived experience in relationship to those data. So there might be demographic data, there might be environmental data. Um, and we've been using this with lots of different folks in different um, contexts. Um, on the left uh, is an image of Mildred McLean, who's an environmental justice activist in Savannah, Georgia. And we've been working with her on um, um, rethinking what resilience means for coastal communities, marginalized, historically marginalized, um, low-income coastal communities in Georgia who are facing a rising sea levels, but also um, other kinds of environmental threats, including air and soil pollution from uh, industries along the coast. And then of course, most recently the pandemic. And, um, and then on the right um, is an image from a, uh, a version of the map room we did with uh, some um, uh, uh, planners and designers in Atlanta who are concerned with the future of public space in the city. And you can also see from these images kind of how radically accessible the system is that anyone can just pick up a marker and start to draw. Um, and so you have like a, a, a I don't know, eight, eight or seven or eight year old kid on, on, on the right hand side. Um, but also, you know, older people who don't necessarily have a lot of experience using computers, um, using the system doesn't really feel like using a computer. And it, it, it kind of really opens up new ways of working with data. Here's the, the version in the lab at Georgia Tech. There's a projector hung from a, um, a rail overhead and it moves back and forth. And so that allows us to create these incredibly long maps. These are 16 foot long maps. And you know the, the image below is actually was drawn by 17 students <laughs> working at the same time pretty much um, for an hour, but with no prior training. So that, that gives you a sense of kind of what, what can be done. Also, because you're working with this kind of physical medium, you can attach anything you want to the map. So they took photographs and brought them in and pasted them on the map and you know, used different kinds of markers. They came up with their own visual language for kind of diagramming things that they were looking at in, um, issues of gentrification in Atlanta around a big urban redevelopment um, project called the Atlanta Beltline. Um, and uh, we've also, and here's a, a close up and it kind of also gives you a sense of, you know, the, um, the kind of, you know, the ways in which people use this system differently. And, you know, somebody wrote, uh, Let's see, I was stuck in traffic here. <laughs> you know, so people decide what they want to put on the map. And in some sense, it, it, it kind of opens up, you know, you know, if we think of this as a data setting, 
kind of really opens it up to a broader range of sources and, and inputs and um, notions of what can count as evidence for making claims about a place and, and how it's changing. Uh, this is a basic diagram of how it works. Uh, I won't go into this in too much detail, but there's you know cute things like there's a sensor that tells the computer where the projector is on this rail, so um, it can update the map as you move the projector. Uh, and you know we continue to work on uh, bringing this to new places and helping people kind of rethink. Uh, and even challenge the stories that that data tell about their lives and the places they live. Uh, we most recently developed a portable version of this um, to bring it to even more places, and it's basically a short throw projector on a on a tripod, and it can convert almost any table into a mapping surface. And you lay down paper and kind of. Um, designate the area where, where you want to um, make your maps and people draw and you know this we we set this up at a conference in New Orleans um, I guess about a year and a half ago uh, it should go without saying we haven't used this system very much in the last year <laughs> but um, because it does require people to get together but we imagine that it's going to be something that people will really want to do once uh, the pandemic is over um, and we can come back together and make these maps. And then we can project different data on them. So here again, these are also data about gentrification that we've been using. You know, people were reflecting on their uh, visits to New Orleans for this conference, where they went, where they didn't go. Um, and, and we could um, look at their maps in relationship to um, demographic indicators, or sorry, indicators of gentrification from the American Community Survey, which is actually part of the census. Um, things like median income, percentage of educated residents in different census tracts, a percentage of uh, white occupants, um, which is, a, is uh, the, mo the simplest um, proxy for race. Um, and, and you can see that there's kind of there, there are kind of notable ways in which um, the drawings and the data are aligned and, and all kinds of interesting discussions happen about this. Uh, so, you know, I just want to sum this up to maybe give us some time to, to, to talk, to um, have questions. I think, uh, you know, we're often told to think globally, <laughs> uh, act locally, but I think thinking locally can be a, a form of thinking critically um, and to open up questions about how data um, are created, but also, as you can see in the map room example, how they are manifest, how they're, they're made sense of in particular places, using particular tools, um, in particular social settings um, with, you know, that, that really matter to the way that the data kind of manifests as evidence and the kinds of claims they're used to support. And I do think that we can even go so far as to rethink, um, let's say something like openness, um, which we, we, we've come very comfortable to thinking about openness as a property of data, you know, that uh, data can be made technically and legally available, and that means they're open. But what if we thought of openness as a quality of data settings? Um, that, that openness was dependent on their accessibility for certain groups, their um, inclusiveness, you know, who's part of the conversation, who gets to use and make claims with these data, or even the, the indeterminacy of these settings, you know, what can count as data in these spaces? Um, and uh, what kinds of claims can people make? And so I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, so much that we can explore in relationship to this. Um, I do want to mention that I've had a lot of wonderful students that have been involved in this work and, and uh, have been hugely inspiring and, and supportive. So this is not just the work of one person. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'll leave you with, uh, with this thought that, um, as we seek to explore the world, data can be a wonderful starting point, 
Uh, they can be uh, bridges. They can serve as an opportunity to get closer to people and places and, and, and institutions beyond data. But we shouldn't take the availability of data as permission to remain at a distance. I'll stop there and take some questions. Thank you so much for a very inspiring and clear presentation. So this is this is really good.